chased through an orange grove. I grew up in a small Southern California town, known for its orange groves from days gone by. All those groves have been replaced by housing developments and shopping centers now, but there were still quite a few around when I was growing up in the 90s. My friend Johnny and I used to get into all kinds of trouble back then. We were just general miscreants, but there was one time I truly believe we almost became the victims of a creep. If anyone reading this also grew up in the 90s, you know that it was a totally different era. We'd be out all times of the day, and our parents would have no idea where we were. There were lots of kidnappings back then. I can remember multiple times that I was offered candy, or asked by some creep to help him find his cat. I always said I'd go check with my mom, and by the time she'd get outside ready to whoop some ass, he'd be gone. So anyway, Johnny and I were up to no good one day after school. We were traipsing around this orange grove that bordered his street. We started pulling these little damn things off the irrigation channels and tossing them wantonly. All of a sudden, we hear a sharp whistle and both of us look up to see this man about 25 feet away from us, wagging his finger going, uh, 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 but his reaction was not at all proportional to the property damage we were causing. He clearly didn't own or work in the grove because instead of screaming at us to stop, he had a grin from ear to ear. I can still see his face in my mind all these years later, and it gives me the chills. Johnny and I stood there for a second watching this guy. Then we looked at each other, and Johnny looked back towards the guy and shouted, Run! I look over, and the guy is in an all-out sprint towards us. Despite the physical exertion he was putting into his sprint, the grin was still there. Johnny and I ran harder and faster than we ever had before. We made it out of the grove and back to his house before noticing the guy wasn't behind us anymore. We quickly forgot about it because Johnny's family had just gotten a Nintendo 64 and we started playing Mario. I can't remember if it was the next day or week, but sometime after this happened, we were with his mom getting donuts and we saw a wanted poster with a sketch of a man that looked awfully similar to the guy who chased us. He was wanted for trying to kidnap a boy outside of a school. Johnny and I looked at each other and seemingly telepathically agreed to never say a word. I don't know why we never spoke up. Maybe because we were at that age, where we'd be relentlessly bullied by homophobes because of the mere possibility that we could have been assaulted. But we never did speak of it again. As I'm typing this, I'm considering reaching out to him to see if he remembers and if it aligns with my memory of the incident. There were so many different things that happened in my childhood in the 90s that could have easily ended with me dead. Somehow, I'm still here and I have my own family now. I trust no one because of incidents like that. I always have my head on a swivel. So to the creep that chased me and Johnny in that orange grove that day, let's not meet. So this started about two to three years back. I had just experienced a terrible breakup and I started receiving these disturbing phone calls. It started simple. The first call I answered and the person on the other end said how much they missed me. Now I have a very small circle of friends and I am not on Facebook or any social site where I update my photos or daily activities. This is important. And I know that the ex I just split up with had nothing to do with the following. Apologies. It's not short. The first call, like I said, was simple. They said they missed me. I asked who it was and they said it's me. Don't you remember? So I hung up and they immediately called back, crying and upset that I was being mean. The caller was clearly an adult male, but they were talking as though they were a very young child. I hung up again, and they didn't call back. Looking back, I should have blocked the number, but as I mentioned, I just got blindsided by a breakup and wasn't thinking very well. Then they kept calling. They would call, and if I didn't answer, they left messages, saying how pretty I looked with my blue sweater that day, or that they knew how I took my coffee now and said they would remember it for when we finally went out for a drink together. I blocked the numbers and they would call from another. I answered one day, yelling at them to leave me alone and hung up again. When they called back, it wasn't the boy, but his mother. She was very upset, said I was hurting her boy by not wanting to play, and you could very clearly hear the boy crying and screaming in the background. At this point, it dawned on me that this wasn't a joke, prank, or something. There was something seriously wrong with these people, and they were obviously watching me. For a few weeks following my breakup, I had to live in my car. The entire time I hardly slept. I was terrified thinking I would wake up one day and see him standing outside of one of my windows. When I finally got a place, he called to congratulate me and he couldn't wait to come and play. 
I haven't heard from the people for a year now, but I checked my phone after a very busy workday and noticed 10 missed calls. I'm terrified to check my voicemail. I've reached out to the cops, but they won't do anything since I haven't been explicitly threatened and have been advised to just block calls. I'm going to change my number, but I'm terrified that the calls won't continue even after that and that it will upset them further. I posted this on the advice subreddit and people have been kind to reach out with advice and tips, but I feel like I'm living in a horror movie. She heard a voice from above that said it was her mission in life to keep an eye on me. It's hard for me to write this because it's only been a year since it stopped. It started in 2014 and it happened in my home country of Sweden when I went to an art school for a summer course as a form of daily activity. The people in this art school were some of the worst people I have ever met and that included me because I was kind of trash back then too. I was 21 years old and had little experience of the real world. I had gone through two extra years of school because of switching majors and taking an extra year on my second choice, so I was literally in my first year of independence. I also have a light form of autism and didn't receive schooling until I was 12, which made me a bit more slowly developed mentally during high school. Basically, I was a 21-year-old with very little experience in life. The people I met at the art school were not, let's say, the highest of achievers. They were some of the meanest and most terrible people I have ever met. They treated each other awfully, as well as the teachers, but I was quite a little turd too. In fact, I feel like being around those people also made me worse. What started the stalking was an incident involving acrylic paint. It was going to be thrown away, so some of us took some of the paint so it wouldn't go to waste, and I finally took what was left over. Well, this is when she showed up. Her name was Anna, and this is how she introduced herself. My art teacher was pushing these big tables on a trolley through a narrow passageway of the art hall. And Anna, dressed in expensive designer clothes, stood in her way. So my art teacher, not fearing anything, screams, Move it! Anna snaps towards her with a crazy look in her eyes and shouts, Excuse me? Do you know who I am? I'm a famous woman. My art teacher, not impressed, responds with, Okay, famous woman, move it. That's how we learned of Anna the famous artist. She then proceeded to have all the terrible people of my class schmooze over her and treat her like a celebrity. But her real reason for being there was because of her paint. So the great hunt began. I was roped into it, and my initial plan was to just give her back her paint so she could be off. Except during the hunt, I got these terrifying red flags. She kept sniffing the paint of other people to see if any were hers. Apparently she had poured some kind of oil into the paint so she could sniff her way to where they were. During the hunt, she admitted that she had been put into treatment for the criminally insane because she had stalked a previous schoolmate that she thought had stolen paint from her. She even showed a CCTV video of her old schoolmate pulling a suitcase behind her, saying that's where she had the paint that she stole. I asked her how she got the video, and she said that her dad had connections with the local government, which had gotten the video from one of the local government's cameras. During this time, she even showed me the court document which she had saved as a PDF on her phone. She also admitted that she had been sending messages to a famous artist in Orobro because a voice from heaven told her to do it and that he was destined to help her with her career. Anna also thought that staring wide-eyed made her more attractive, like the kind of stare where you can't see any of the eyelids at all. So while she was saying all this, she had this crazy-eyed look on her face. I was terrified of her and couldn't figure out a way of handing back the paint so she ended up threatening to have the principal fired if she couldn't search every room for the paint. And when she did find all of her paint, she put it in one of the school rooms and said that she would pick it up when she wanted to. She said that she would come every year during the art exhibit to check if her paint was still there and that she would sue the school if she found it missing. What a crazy person. End of story. Right? How I wish. About two years later, I enrolled in a one-year basic art program at the school. I had completely forgotten about this crazy person. At one point we were cleaning out the art rooms and her paint was brought up again and it would again be thrown away. Me not remembering that crazy famous artist took a nice crimson bottle for myself while others took some of the not ruined color for themselves. Then as we all tried to continue with our lives, the crazy lady one day returned and started sniffing all the color. I didn't recognize her at all and had forgotten about how dangerously deranged she was. I had even forgotten that I had gotten the crimson color from her paint, 
So when she started interrogating me for why the paint smelled like hers, I didn't know what to say. She also smelled her paint at some other girl's table and was harassing her as well. Thinking that this was all more fuss than it was worth, I threw away the crimson paint and that was when everything went to hell and the crazy-eyed Anna became my stalker. When she found out that I had thrown away the paint, she became convinced that I had re-enrolled at the art school specifically to steal her paint. She started convincing a bunch of gullible and to be honest, low-achieving people that this was true and I started being harassed. It started with a physical attack. I was painting alone in the evening, minding my own business, when this huge brute ran into me, tackling me to the floor and started hitting and kicking me. While this was happening, crazy-eyed Anna was fake crying in the corner, but I could see from the floor how she went from fake crying to gleefully smiling as I was being kicked and hit. Another girl she had recruited picked up and smashed my phone, breaking it. As the guy stormed off and the second girl followed, I stumbled onto my feet and asked Anna why she had done this, and the answer she gave me made me realize what kind of person she was, so you will know that I can hurt you if I want. That is the answer she gave me. I later asked the brute why he had attacked me, and he said that he hated people who stole. I had bruised my ribs, but was not allowed to go to the hospital because the principal didn't want to get involved, and since my phone was broken, I couldn't call for an ambulance and it took so long to get to the hospital that the outside signs of abuse had healed. During this time, crazy-eyed Anna started wearing a crimson jacket wherever she went. I asked her why she was wearing it, and also said she looked pretty, thinking that talking nicely to her would start a friendly conversation to maybe smooth everything over. Well, Anna is not like normal people, and does not think like normal people. Her response was that she wanted me to think of her every time I saw this color, and said that she had seen it work in a movie. She then added, I am more beautiful than you will ever be. Wherever she went, she had a horde of schmoozers around her, all thinking she was some kind of famous and fancy artist. But eventually, she had to leave the school, and I thought I had peace. Except she one day suddenly showed up and gleefully presented me with the school's Russian exchange student. This student had been sitting at my table every day for weeks, and I hadn't paid in any mind because, why would I? She was allowed to sit there. But this is when crazy-eyed Anna drops the bombshell that this exchange student was A, not a real exchange student, and B, she had been putting her phone on the table each mealtime while having it on speaker with Anna, on the other end silently listening in on my conversations. I remember when she first told me how I didn't believe it. I didn't believe, and part of me still had a hard time realizing the lengths this woman was going to were real, but it was what she said next that terrified me the most. She said, I know about the secret messages behind your words. I know what you are up to, and I heard a voice from above that told me that it was my mission to keep an eye on you and make sure you behave. The abuse at school escalated quickly after this. I was harassed and cornered in every classroom and chased around school, and at the same time, I got no help. It escalated into a happening one late weekend night. I was sitting at the school's texture room when a guy suddenly burst in and started running towards me screaming, what makes you think you can sit here? He did not go to this school. I jumped out of a window and started running towards my dorm and managed to call 112 in the meantime and managed to scream out that I needed help and where I was. I ran towards my dorm, but another guy was waiting for me there. So I ran towards the head building, but a third guy was waiting there. They cornered me and I remember how scared I was. I thought I was going to die. But then, light of hope blue and red lights from the road. I was saved. I remember how happy I was to see that police officer. Everything would finally be over. He walked up to the girl who orchestrated all of it, Maylin, and he greeted her like a friend. Then I knew. I knew in that moment that he wouldn't save me. I screamed for help and he ignored me. She told him that there was no issue here, and he said he was looking forward to seeing her around town. Then he left. He left me. He just drove away. The last thing I remember is the backlights of the police car driving away. I woke up the next morning laying on the ground with a huge bump on the side of my head. I don't know what happened. Malin claims they never touched me and I just passed out when one of the guys grabbed me. I know better. I know the pain I felt in the huge bump on the side of my head. I called 112 and I called for an ambulance. At this time, because of the abuse, I had memory loss and couldn't quite tell the lady what the issue was but I made a mistake. I told her that I had called 112 the day after and that the police officer just left me. 
Then she got mad, really mad. She told me that I was slandering her coworker and to only call if I actually needed help. Then she hung up and I was alone again with no one, not a single person on my side. I tried to make a police report against Anna and Malin, but the officer had heard about me and deleted my report. It was during this time that I had had enough and thought about ending it. So I was forcefully put into a mental health ward, but the stalking didn't stop. Crazy-eyed Anna had a friend of hers be committed so that she could come into the ward as a visitor in order to harass me. When I tried to go to art school again, she had people that had threatened me join the same program so that they could keep an eye on me. At home, she would have another guy park outside of my house a few times a week in order to scare me. She would also have things stolen from me, things like shoes, gloves, and the like. According to the people doing the stealing, this was because she had watched the movie where someone steals items and then puts them back to make someone go insane from the harassment. Crazy-eyed Anna would also call me a few times a year, lying about being a data collector to get private information out of me. Because I lived in a big city far away at the time, she constantly forced others to do the stalking for her. Most of them she had given drugs to at one point, and then she would threaten them to do what she wanted by threatening to report them to the police if they wouldn't. Others, she just bribed with money or charmed. I have gone on hour-long bus rides where someone admits to being there for her sake. Most people are afraid of her because she won't leave them alone, and she will do to them what she does to me if they don't say yes to her. One girl was roped into standing all dressed in red outside of my supermarket. Another girl was also roped into sitting in her car outside of my house for a few hours a few days a week, all because of the fear of this woman. I learned from a cousin of hers that she affords all of this because she won an art prize for half a million sec at one point. It's why she thinks she's famous. I also learned that most of her biological family has cut contact with her because she has been doing this since she was a teenager. And yet even with that information, no one would listen. When I tell people what she has done to me, people call me the crazy one. I have no history of delusions or making up tall tales, yet it was so much easier for people to just think I'm crazy. I have even been forcefully medicated at some points with psychosis medication that baffled doctors lamented over not working. Not even my family believes me, something that has forever barred how much trust I can put into the relationship between us. I asked her once why she was doing all this, and she said to punish you. I asked her how long I would need to be punished, and she answered, for as long as I want. At one point, I even considered killing her. I am the kind of person who catches flies alive in a cup and let them out the window. I have never harmed another human being. I have never been violent. Yet at one point, felt so desperate for freedom that I would take prison rather than being haunted by crazy-eyed Anna anymore. I was more afraid of her than prison. Then, it stopped. It just stopped. Still a year later, I don't know why it stopped. Nothing in her history tells me that she would stop willingly, so I'm convinced that she either ran out of people to threaten into doing her bidding, or something has happened to her. It's possible that one of those people finally reported her, and actually got taken seriously. I don't know. Even so, I can't feel relief. Not yet. I'm so afraid that it'll start again, and I have given up all hope of being taken seriously by the police. Anna, let's not meet. I've been debating posting this here for a while because I didn't think it was that interesting, but my boyfriend believes it's a great fit for the sub, so why not? When I was 12-ish years old, I was potentially almost kidnapped. I was sitting in my living room, which has a large window facing the main road when I heard someone knock on the door in the mudroom. My dad was downstairs playing on his drum set, and it was well into the evening. I thought it was strange, but figured maybe it was someone who wanted to ask him to play quieter. We've got many noise complaints over the years. When I opened the main door, there was a man, probably in his 40s or 50s, wearing what looked like casual business clothes, jeans, black shoes, and a button-up, standing there that I definitely didn't recognize. I really didn't think much of it, but kept the screen door closed as a precaution. Here's how I vaguely remember our encounter playing out. Hi, I was wondering if I could use your phone. I need to call someone. Uh, sorry. We don't have a landline, and I don't have a cell phone. Oh, that's okay. Do you think I could at least have a glass of water? I can wait here while you grab it. Sorry, we just moved in and haven't unpacked our glasses yet. The creepy dude 
trying way too hard to be friendly. That's all right. Do you have a hose I could drink from? Uh, yeah. It's actually right there on the ground. As I point to the outdoor hose a couple feet from the door. Oh, thank you. Do you think you could turn it on for me? Uh, sorry. No, I don't know how it works. Oh, come on. You don't know how to use a hose? At this point, my fight or flight was in full force, so I just slammed the door, locked it, and ran downstairs to my dad. I told him what happened, and he stormed outside with a baseball bat, but the guy was gone by the time my dad got outside. I never saw him again after that. It still freaks me out to think of what he might have done if he got a hold of me. So, creepy dude who showed up at my house and tried to get me outside to turn on the hose, let's not meet. Charmed, like a snake. Okay, first off, this is a throwaway account I created specifically for this post because I don't want people to nag me about the story, even though while creepy, it ended without much consequences. With that said, I really need to get it off my chest because of how weird it was. It happened back in June of 2018. I was walking in the woods near my campus, which is something I don't do often, but I needed fresh air and the weather was particularly fine that day. So the fancy took me to go on a stroll from there. I was walking for a good 20 minutes when I heard a drumming sound in the distance. Naturally curious and a bit reckless, I went in the direction of the sound, and it appeared to me that this drumming was the sound of actual drums. As a matter of fact, it was a piece of some oriental music. The music eventually led me down to a clearing where I saw its source. It came from a pocket speaker, probably linked to a phone, beside which, there was a lady, dancing in the middle of the woods. She seemed to be in her 30s and wore really hippie looking clothes. Then she noticed me and said hi with a smile and gestured for me to come over. She seemed nice enough and I didn't feel especially uncomfortable so I did. We chatted a bit then I learned her name was Beatrice and she explained to me that she liked to practice belly dance out in the open, that the noises of nature added some flair to the music. She then asked me if I wanted to see some moves. I wasn't in a hurry. So I accepted and sat down on a nearby stump. She then grabbed her phone to start another piece of music before she began her little dance show. I don't know how long I had been watching her, but after a while, my whole body began to feel numb and each time I tried to look around, my eyes felt like they were being pulled towards her. I also tried to move but my muscles just wouldn't respond. It was like I was a prisoner inside of my own body. I'm not exaggerating. She then extended a hand towards me and twirled her hand in a snake-like way that my head followed on her own. She then gestured in a way that looked like she was pulling me out. Then, I swear, my body raised from my improvised chair on itself. It's a really weird phenomenon, but you need to imagine that my body was completely disassociated from my conscious mind. I couldn't make a sound. I couldn't control my muscles. I could only feel my body from head to toe, somehow match her dance. I don't know for how long it went, because I was getting really dizzy, but after a while she went behind me, put a hand on my tummy, and the other on my eyes. Then I felt all of my limbs go limp as I blacked out. I woke up later laying in the grass. The woman was nowhere to be seen, but I could still see the prints left by her stuff. Needless to say, I scrammed as quickly as I could from these woods. Fortunately, I've never bumped into the gal again afterwards, and I wasn't especially traumatized but it was a really creepy experience nonetheless. So please, Beatrice, let's not meet. What did he want? Sorry for the long explanations. I really want to make the details clear for you to understand the situation better. Also, please don't mind my grammar mistakes. English is my third language. I'm a girl living in Northern Europe I won't go in too much detail where this happened because I don't want people to recognize me from this story. This story takes place in October when I had a part-time job in this research center. This was in a bigger city, not like in the middle of it, but it was a 30 minute bus ride from where I lived at the time. Keep in mind that the workplace was an industrial estate. So the only people that really spent time in the area were the workers from these companies. I worked all three shifts, mornings, evenings, and nights but I did mostly night shifts because none of my coworkers really wanted them and I'm a night owl anyways. So that 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. shift worked really well for me. 
This happened on one of these night shifts. It was a Thursday night, and I was one of three workers there that night. We did not work together. We were all in our own departments doing different kind of work. Also, far from each other in the building. I worked at a chem lab doing water analysis, so it was not any kind of customer service job. We were basically all alone, and it usually got really quiet and rather peaceful. We had no security guards, but it was quite impossible to enter the building without an identification card. All doors were locked, and everyone that worked there had these cards where you hold it to the sensor, and the door opens. You also have to use this card when leaving the building. These locked doors were not only on the outside, but also inside the building. So if someone somehow managed to get through the first door, without a card they could not get any further in the building, to the labs for example. The doors lock again immediately after you get in or out, considering that we never really had to worry about someone uninvited getting in, even in the nighttime. This particular night, I took a bus and headed to work. I greeted my coworkers that were leaving as their shifts had just ended and met the other night shifters in the women's dressing room. All normal. I was in a good mood. And so were my two coworkers. When our shift started, we parted our ways and went to different labs. I was three hours into my shift at 1 a.m. when I decided to take my 20 minute break. The two workers that were on their break earlier than me said I had to go alone this time. Our break room was a lounge where there was a couple of long tables, chairs, mini kitchen, and the bathroom. I'm not gonna lie, this big hall with old flickering ceiling lights was not my favorite place to be alone in at 1 a.m. when the whole building is almost empty and it's pitch black outside. There were big windows in the lounge, but I could not see anything out of them, just darkness. And there was always this same eerie vibe at nighttime, so I was used to it. Five minutes into my break, I decided to go outside to smoke a cigarette. I put a jacket on, took my shit with me, and opened the door with the card. We had this smoking area in the back of the parking lot, about a one minute walk from the door. If I said I wasn't scared to be alone in an empty parking lot at night, as a young girl, I would be lying. This was the only thing I really did not like about the night shifts, but I really needed that cigarette. Nothing bad had ever happened, and I live in a generally safe country, so I just hoped for the best. There was this nasty white plastic chair in the smoking area. I sat in it and lit my cigarette. From the smoking area, I could clearly see the entrance of the building. There were bright lights above the door. Usually I just stared at the door without even noticing it. I mean, it was a night in an industrial area and there were not many interesting things to look at. But all of a sudden, I noticed a person walking up to the door. It was a man with a trench coat and a top hat holding a briefcase. I have never seen this man before, in my work or anywhere near this place. This man stood still in front of the door, not moving at all, facing the door. Even though nothing seemingly bad had happened yet, just a weird man standing by the door, I cannot even explain in words how scared I was. I had to somehow get past the man to get back inside. He doesn't know I'm there. He didn't see me. What if he does something to me when I'm trying to get inside? Is he trying to get inside? What does he want? And who is he? This was the only door where I could enter the building from outside. So I had no choice but to try and ignore that man on the door. What on earth is this weirdly dressed man doing in this area at 1am? There is clearly something he wants from us. And I wasn't even sure if I wanted to know what that was. I started walking towards the man and the door. While he was still standing not knowing I'm here in the parking lot. The closer I got, the more scared I got. I had to stop and think again. I knew it was part of my job to confront unwanted people trying to get in and tell them how to contact our customer services. But keep in mind this was 1am. A weird man who appeared out of thin air and an 18 year old girl. Alone. I had this gut feeling that I should not go to the door. So I decided to call a coworker that was there that night and asked if she could meet me at the door to let me in. So I didn't need to face this man alone. I went and hid behind my coworker's car that was in the parking lot to make a call. I was hiding behind the car in a position where I could still see the man through the car windows. I wanted to see if he leaves and where he goes. My coworker answers the call when I start whispering into the phone and explain the situation. Then I watch in horror as the man turns around and stares right at the car I was hiding behind. I don't think he saw me, but he for sure heard that there was a woman talking behind this car. What happened next is straight out of a horror film. 
When this man found out there was someone behind the car, he started slowly and quietly approaching me, not knowing I could see him through the window. And here's the thing, he did not walk, he did not run, he was on all fours, crawling towards the goddamn car. I couldn't even scream, I just froze from fear, and the phone dropped from my hand. When this man was getting closer to the car, I could see both of my coworkers opening the door waving and screaming for me to run and come in, and did not need to tell me twice. I ran inside so fast the man didn't even have time to react. When he got up and started running after me, the door was already closed. The second he heard the door lock itself he turned around and started speed walking away, eventually disappearing into the darkness. We called the police immediately, and they came not long after, but they didn't find anything or anyone. That man disappeared as fast as he had appeared, and no one has seen him since. After the shift, my coworkers walked me to the bus stop and waited with me until the bus arrived, making sure I got home safely. I am forever thankful to these lovely women for opening the door for me, before that man got me, and God knows what he would have done to me. I haven't done any night shifts after that, and for sure never will.